fairy maidens. It's a delightful and enigmatic Neolithic stone circle. It's similar to many found all over this western tip of England in Cornwall. Enigmatic it may be, peaceful, enchanting even. But why are they here? It's a question that's puzzled us all for centuries. And it's a question that brought a team of specialists here to this site on a beautiful but cold and windy October day, 2003. The aim was to make a program exploring Earth energies that we could show to broadcast television companies to try to get a commission for a series. You'll see the pilot for that program later on on this tape, but before that, we'll show you interviews with each of the Spirit of the Serpent team. Those of us who got together to explore the Earth energy at these sacred sites are all experts in our own particular subject, but not all, as you might expect, in archaeology or history. What we all have in common is our desire to understand the relevance of Earth energy at these sites and to try to understand how the ancients interacted with it. The Spirit of the Serpent team is made up of Hamish Miller. He's a dowser, metal sculptor, author, and world-leading expert on Earth energy. He's appeared on television, talked on radio, and lectured in Europe, America, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa. He's currently researching Maori knowledge of Earth energy. Jim Lyons works in a research capacity at York University. He holds degrees in physics and engineering, and as a member of the British Society of Dowsers, undertakes research into the geo and biophysics of Earth energies with particular interest in the mechanism of dowsing based on quantum ideas in consciousness. Quantum physics being the physics of energy and matter. Julie Soskin is a sensitive, or what people sometimes call a psychic or a medium. As a sensitive, she gathers insights from places or people. She's the author of six books, researching a PhD in psychospiritual studies, and in 1996 she founded the School of Insight and Intuition in London. Bar Russell is partner to Hamish and spent 30 years as a practicing physiotherapist and healer. For the last two decades, she's worked in the field of dowsing and earth energy with particular interest in its effects on the environment. And finally me, Rupert Soskin. I originally qualified in art and design, but I've spent my life studying the natural world. Most of my time these days is spent leading walking parties to explore man's relationship with the earth and nature. So that's the team. As we'll see, earth energies play a major part in the location of these sites but just how big a part is what we're trying to find out. Coming up later, you'll have a chance to see the first ever programme we made under the title of The Spirit of the Serpent, when, as a team, we got together for the first time to explore Earth energies at a sacred site. But now, let's meet each of the team to understand why they became involved with this project and what each of us has to offer in this exploration. We'll start with an interview with Hamish Miller, when he was in his 50s, Hamish was an award-winning entrepreneur running his own furniture-making business, but his life changed abruptly when he was taken into hospital for emergency surgery. The first thing I was aware of at, uh, later on was um, looking up and seeing the surgeon and hearing him say, pity you were too late, chaps. And he took off his mask and went off. And I... Uh, was a bit concerned because I had all my faculties were still there. And then I became aware that I wasn't looking at the surgeon from the operating table, but I was way above looking down. And he was chatting and, and they were closing the place up and putting lights out and all that sort of thing. And I had this incredible experience of, of, of moving up into a, a misty sort of area and then becoming aware that I was in a tunnel. And it was, in, it was totally peaceful. It was, it was um, a place of absolute compassion, of understanding, of uh, no coercion to do anything at all. And I became aware actually that I wasn't me. I was a, a long tube with the, the rounded ends, and I was. This tunnel started to form around the, the mist. And as soon as I was aware of that, the 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 tube started to move up the tunnel. There was a vague light at the end. And uh, it came to rest just at the end of the, the tunnel. And I got out 
I was no longer the tube. I was a sort of virtual baby in nappies, if you like, a symbol of total innocence, but, but completely without fear and very curious about the, the light. And, and then it, it, this experience starts, it starts getting trite because I didn't really have the language to describe it. But I got out and I went into this area of, of lighter area which was sort of floored like alabaster marble and vague colours and movements of... And there were beings, not that I could see, but that I was aware of. And they were completely uh, compassionate, loving, uh, incredibly caring beings. And they said, this is the, this is the entrance to... And I, the wording is difficult here. The entrance to the... Uh, level of life, if you like. Um, these are our concepts, and these are some of our concepts. And if you feel that you uh, have, if you can contribute to them, or even if you can understand them, you're very welcome to come in. But we'll, they actually gave me all the experiences of all my lifetimes to make the decision whether to come in. And I looked at these concepts, and I, frankly, I didn't understand them. I, I thought, I just don't know enough. And I said uh, to these, not said, but communicated to these amazing beings, um, I think I ought to go back. And then I was aware, for the first time, of the huge humour that's in the universe, and there was a sort of chuckle of appreciation. <laughs> And the voices in unison said, we think you should. <laughs> so I did. I got back into the the tube and went hurtling down the tunnel, knowing that at the end of it, and the visual thing was shards of glass that, that uh, I was going to have to go through and, and pain. And in the event, I, I just went through with, with no pain at all. And, and the next thing I knew was a voice saying, shouting, Mr. Miller, are you in there? And I wanted to communicate all this to, to where I'd been and what had happened, what a wonderful thing it was. So having come back into my body, um, I came back with a completely new set of values. All the, all the values I'd had before, all the, the important things that I seemed to be doing before were, were just a nonsense. And, and I was just so glad to be alive and be able to, capable of... of, of appreciating what we have here of sounds and people and 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 colors and flowers and and growing things and it was it was a f fundamentally life-changing experience and the other big thing is i came back completely without fear of anything because once you once you're not afraid of death there's not much point in being afraid of of anything else and I decided that what I was doing was not very satisfying, so I came down to Cornwall and I, I, down, down here because I knew there was something down. I'd been pulled down here for years. Very shortly after I moved down here, there's a, a clairvoyant walked around the corner, I didn't know who he was. And he stopped and he looked at me and he said, uh, are you involved in healing? And I said, no, I didn't know what healing was. And he said, well, you should be. And... Uh, he said, um, he talked about healing and the National Federation and, and the way people can be healed. And, and I thought, this this is a real nutter. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, come up the hill, walk up the hill. And we walked up to the top of Trent Crom Hill. And he said, uh, you ought to be involved in healing people. But he said, you have to be involved with healing the earth. And I backed off a bit, and I thought, well, you know, who is this guy, and what is this about? And he said, the, the earth energy centre of this hill is here, and that's why you've been drawn to the hill. And uh, we came back down, and I thanked him, and I said goodbye, and I thought, this, this <laughs> Cornwall is full of <laughs> strange people. And it just went on the back burner. And then shortly after that, there was a... Um, an advertisement for a talk by Colin Bloy, who was using dowsing and healing. 
And I was certainly interested in the healing bit, and I was intrigued by the dancing bit, so I went along to that. It was in Devon. And he was demonstrating this, this dowsing technique and, and healing technique and using dowsing to, to, um, to find out where things were wrong. And then he started talking about the, the energy in the land and the energy that the, the old Templars had left in various places and the extraordinary manifestations that you could pick up on land and the energy from the stones. And I went up to him at the end and said, uh, can you point me to a dowser in Cornwall? Because I'd love to work with the stones and douse them. And he said, do it yourself. And walked away. And I thought, I felt, I felt totally rejected. And of course he was right, because he opened this door to me. And it was a few months later that uh, I went into the forest and I whacked out one of these big dowsing rods that around somewhere. And I very tentatively walked across the garden here and said, is there, a, is there an energy line between Trencrom Hill and St Michael's Mount? And I got this very, very faint reaction, which completely changed my life. Then I started to work because Colin Bloy had done something. He'd started a thing called Fountain International, and that was about healing the earth by using, um, or healing towns and villages and places by uh, deciding on, on, a, on a, an important place called the Hara and getting people to concentrate and love it and, and, and care. And he could do the variations in energy that, that, that came out of these Haras. And also had done some work on the on what the Templars understood about earth energy, which was quite fundamental as well. So I wanted to 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 concentrate on whether the the energy here was different from the energy in Sussex. And and the the, the odd thing about the fountain group is that the energy's manifestations used to come for a time and then change. So Bai used to dowse up in, in Sussex, and I dowsed down here. And, and we got very, very similar manifestations, actually, and, and changes at, at absolutely the same time. Uh, to me, the, the Earth Energy System is its uh, nervous and meridian system, same as, same as ours, much more complex. It's a cobweb of, of energy lines all over the surface and under and, and above the Earth. We are cosmically connected to everything else in the universe through these energy lines. They come into the earth at certain points. And there, according to the Druid tradition, there are, there are 12 major circles of energy around there, bands of energy around there, not necessarily great circles. And where these cross are, are particularly sacred sites. And one of them actually is St. Michael's Mount down here. Um, and then from from every living thing, every leaf, every blade of grass, every person, every building, there is a little, because we are just energy forms, all of us, there is a little energy centre and there's a connection to the next and the next and the next, and it's a vast, complex cobweb, but not just on the surface, it goes below this. I've doused 1,900 feet down a mine and still find earth energy. I mean, the Chinese have known about, uh, been working for 4,000 years on, on earth energy, and we call it Feng Shui. I, I'm not sure whether the practice of Feng Shui transfers very well between cultures, because there is a deep understanding of, of, of earth energy and, uh, and all its, its subtle related um, spiritual and emotional uh, changes that it can can be involved, and I think when it transfers to this country, it it uh, tends to be totally simplified. We were in Australia t uh, three years ago, I think, and we were very anxious to meet one of the bush rangers there, who was in charge of 170 no 470 square miles of of Aboriginal land where there were some of the the ancient Aborigines living. 
and he was he was a dancer and he was really into earth energy and all of these things and in 17 years he said he has not been able to get close to the knowledge and uh, he says that just occasionally he 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 looks after this piece of land he knows all the legends and and all of that and just occasionally he says i see an elder sitting in one particular place and and he'll acknowledge me but not say anything and he says i don't know what he's doing but it's something pretty important and then he just sort of disappears and back into his place so they're 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 preserving it they are i think desperately afraid that it if if they uh if we find out about it we'll misuse it which normally we do and we had an astonishing experience in in new zealand where i had doused one of the marais the sacred really sacred site in south island where the maoris had had uh, they had certain stages where if you took 10 years to, to develop the capability of assimilating the energy from these places up the mountain. And there was a marae which was normally the, the woman's place. It was full of water. And we went up there and I doused and there was, there was, I think there were five energy lines coming into it and uh, a huge spiral and lots and lots of radials coming out of it. Very, very active place, but no manifestation in it. And while we were there, there was we, we sort of moved in and out of a party which included um, a Maori girl called Donna, who had been taken from her family very early, about four years old, because they recognised that she had the potential to have the knowledge of energy, and she lived with the elders who taught her this. And I watched her standing or sitting beside this this pool, and I had put a stone where I found the Earth Energy Centre, and without um, anyone's knowledge she had brought one of her sacred green stones the punamo stone with her pack on the back and she very very carefully walked into the center of this this thing and and uh, moved my stone and, and put her stone down she hadn't seen me dancing she hadn't seen me putting the stone there and that was a, a huge vindication for for me actually but it was an absolute delight because she had a long ceremony and she put this thing and com communed. And I went up the next day and there was there was still no water in the in the thing. It was dusty. And I asked for a manifest if there was a manifestation, and I was able to draw it out in the dust. And it was the most beautiful, nine-petaled thing that there was uh, nine double petals on it. And there were nine round a diameter of, of something like uh, 14 feet. And I was able to, to use one dowsing rod and follow the thing round and, and mark it and make the mark in the dust. And it ended up absolutely perfectly where I'd started. Now, you can't do that in a 14-foot in a circle with all these complicated shapes. And it just fitted perfectly in the end. I almost cried. I mean, it was just so beautiful. And that was the result of her knowledge and communication, her consciousness, her training. And the manifestation was beautiful. Now, that happened within uh, overnight. I think what happened was that the ancients were very, very closely tuned to the earth and its energies. And they would uh, travel to a place where they felt good about the energy in the place and they would sit down and if there was a a local well that would supply them water they would stay there and as soon as they, they stayed they would start ceremony and as soon as the ceremony started the earth energy would respond and it would grow stronger and bigger and then it would become a place of where more people would come in and communicate with this this center and it would become a sacred site because of the ritual so the sacred site developed with a with with a possibly a natural piezoelectric effect on the a magnetic anomaly or something which made them feel interested if you like and then the conscious input from the, the humans would start making it uh, develop in a communicate a way of communicating with them and them feeling good ley lines are perfectly valid they are they are uh technically they are straight alignments of more than three sacred sites or special sites and to some people they are enormously important um, 
they're quite important to us because the the whole concept of the Michael and Mary thing started with a, a straight alignment of St. Michael sites from St. Michael's Mount up to Avebury by John Michel. Also, the Rishi brothers discovered that there was an alignment of sacred sites from Athens to uh, St. Michael's Kellig in Southern Ireland, going through an extraordinary number and uh, I mean it's not an absolutely straight line because if if uh, St Michael wanted a site on the Michael line and there was a huge crag there he would put his big cathedral there <laughs> on the top of it oh, which is slightly off and nobody could quite understand why but you see once you start following the the energy line the energy line weaves around the straight line and move, goes into these places and then moves out again and generally keeps the direction of the of the ley line. So that's why I think the ley lines are important. They are the indicators that there is something important happening underneath. That's only my opinion. Because the energy lines are made up from a number of different frequencies, it very often happens that one of the frequencies, uh, that the whoever it is, is, doesn't resonate with that frequency. And it, they feel slightly uncomfortable. And... Um, what that what happens is that they they automatically compensate for this feeling of discomfort by using their own energy, and that makes them tired. And if they get tired, they get ill. And and every time they go through it, it's exacerbated this effect. So they get to the stage sometimes where if it's in a particular room, they they can't use that room. So all we do is go in and tune in to these people and and find out whether there's one you can do and find out if there's one energy frequency that's disturbing them and um, have a chat with the management and say look these people have got a problem because of that and they say whoops sorry and they make it a healing energy provided it doesn't affect somebody else down the line but they can do that and we can't I did become much more sensitive to the subtleties of all of the earth energy fields and this meant more sensitive to reactors of people uh, it meant that that um, when I was healing I was much more aware of of the healing problem if you like or the problems people had difficult to be specific just just a whole a, a moving up, if you like, of the understanding of our place. It sounds pompous, but it's not. It's an understanding of, of, of where this human species is in the universe. And I came to the conclusion that we're actually, because the Earth is, is so patient, that we are quite an important species in the cosmos because we are possibly one of the very few species who is in the physical being but also has a quite a strong element of spirituality. I don't think an Aberdeen Angus bull is aware of its spirituality. <laughs> Much although I admire the Aberdeen Angus, I think we are it's quite important to keep us going in some way, but, but we have to we only survived originally because of our aggression, because it was difficult to survive. We don't need the aggression anymore, but we still have it. And if we, it's actually quite simply moving energy from our base chakra, which is about uh, will to live and and uh, anger and sex and reproduction and um, frustration, if you like. And it's about moving the energy from there. And unfortunately, all the the, the, the media, the advertising, the, the music and all that sort of thing is, is aimed at base chakra. And that gets overloaded. And when that gets overloaded, we get aggressive again. And if we can just somehow or other shift some of that energy to heart chakra, then we have somebody who is slightly more caring. And when they pick up a brick to throw it through a window, something will say, oh, don't do it this time. And that's all we need just a subtle change and and i think that was that was the uh, the essence of what was happening to me one of the things about 
um, earthbound spirits, as far as I understand, is that uh, most of them are just us in a in another version who have moved on, but haven't moved on far enough, and they get trapped in in not in our density, but just out of our density, and they don't quite know where to go. They, they are really desperately lonely and very unhappy, most of them. And uh, it's a great it's a great privilege actually to to be able to help them to move on. What they must never be, as far as I'm concerned, and that's sometimes that happens with the the normal exorcist. Um, they are banned with bell, book, and candle, and I think that's that's so wrong because they're they're completely innocent spirits. And uh, we had a case in point where the, the one of the crew of a, a local trawler quite recently was was uh, drowned, and he kept appearing in his oilskins in the front of the boat to the rest of the crew, and they had a an old fashioned exorcist who came onto the boat and took the boat out, and he uh, railed at this thing to to band and back from where you came from and all that sort of thing, and the poor thing was just trying to establish that it was lost, didn't know where to go. So it's it's uh, it's an act of um, mercy, if you like. It's only when you are able to perceive them and communicate with them you can really do something with them. But there are people who who maintain that they can contact uh, from a distance and and move on. Uh, people, I don't know how much truth is there is. All I can say is that with with. Perhaps ninety percent of the of the ones that we've worked on, we have had um, confirmation back that there is no more disturbance. But this is the consciousness, the soul, the 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 essence, is the bit that goes on after your body dies. And it represent to me, it was represented by this this little innocent babe with the nappies at the end of the tunnel. That was my essence which was totally innocent at that time and, and unafraid, I have to say. And and fully, uh, with all the faculties, plus a few more, I think, that I had before. Jim Lyons is based at York University. With degrees in physics and engineering, he went on to do a postgraduate course in aeronautics. After a long spell in the aerospace industry, he entered academia taking up posts in teaching, research and administration at various institutions. His role in the Spirit of the Serpent team revolves around his immense understanding of physics and how it applies to the laws of nature. But his interest in ancient sites dates from school days. I guess like most things that one gets into these things almost by default. It just so happened that uh, the family lived in Wiltshire, no further than a quarter of a mile away from what was Woodhenge and that's not too far away as many people know from Stonehenge and so as a schoolboy I was able to cycle around Amesbury and lean my cycle against the stones at Stonehenge which of course is no longer possible and therefore this provided me with a very early interest in the whole of uh, the Neolithic scenario. It was when I moved into the academic world I began to realize that lots of the things that I had been doing for very many years in fact tied in with my hobbies quite remarkably and in fact, in the last 10 years, let's, let's say from 1990 or so onwards, I then really started to look at the emerging ideas which were happening at the time in physics and still very much um, part of physics today. That is the idea of really looking at uh, consciousness being part of the whole world of physics. This had never really been phys inside physics for 300 years or so, but now people are taking a much wider perspective and it's really that aspect that's really driven me to bring together my dowsing interests with the world of modern, modern science. If one looks at ancient cultures, then one finds the ideas that uh, this universal energy field that we live in uh, was very well known to, say, the ancient um, Chinese, who called it feng shui. And that is really the name for wind and water. And that gives you instantaneously the idea that the whole thing is to do with the flow of some sort of fluid. And I guess it took me 30 years before that particular key point really sunk in because I already had, as an aerodynamicist, a lot of this toolkit really available to apply to this sort of uh, scenario. 
And when I started to look at what people had done in this area from the research point of view, I found that virtually nothing had been done at all. No modern ideas of fluid, uh, fluid flow had been applied to the idea of subtle energies. And therefore, here was a completely new field of research. And that's what really started me off on the last 10 to 15 years of work. When we talk about energies, uh, we're talking using a term that was really invented in the 19th century. But people were very well aware of effects upon them and the movement of things. And in, in common practice, the, the word energy was around for quite some time. And when we're talking about stone circles, people use it in one, a common everyday format. What uh, I've tried to do from the scientific point of view is apply a true scientific perspective of what we mean by energy to the stone circle scene. Well, we don't see this um, because it is, in fact, what we call a subtle energy. That is, it's operating at very, very fine levels, such that it's not visible to our normal senses. Perhaps you like to call it a sixth sense. I always use the term fifth and a half sense, be uh, sense because it's something that you can, in a way, get your hands on, and in another way, you cannot see it. But there are some people who still retain this ability to see this flow of energy. Uh, and in fact, uh, around various stones, uh, one can see this, this energy manoeuvring from the stones very much in the same way that smoke rises from a chimney. And this vor vortex-type flow is something that's been known since very ancient times. And it's really the analysis of that sort of flow that's the key to this whole, whole scene. I'm totally convinced the ancients, in the very quiet, secluded world, judged from our perspective, would have been able to see it on almost a daily basis. And if you look at uh, cultures today, uh, certain cultures, Aborigines, for example, or the Hopi Indians, they still claim to have this capability to see these natural earth energies, as we call them. And in fact, these earth energies, the shapes that we see at stones, from stone circles, uh, really are no more than you can see in the sky, because it is really the sort of motion you see when you see clouds moving around. Indeed, the, if you look at the patterns of uh, clouds and then start to look at the patterns in the ground of all these Earth energies, you find the same underlying physics in the two things. It really is quite remarkable. And this is something we've discovered in, in the last five years. Well, stone circles are positioned in very specific points on the Earth. I talked about these patterns of energies in the ground, and in fact, they're essentially lines running north, south, east, and west, but they're not straight lines. They're these wonderful curly patterns, curly Q type patterns. But essentially stone circles are always built at the crossover of these energy lines. And indeed it's true for medieval churches as well. Right until about the 17th century churches were still built in precisely this very specific way. And at the crossover of these energy lines you always find them associated with underground water. And if you can analyse in great detail what a stone circle does, it's the combination of the stones together with the underground water that generates all these wonderful patterns of energy and indeed lots of effects on humans as well. So we're not just talking here about uh, the energy on its own, we're talking about the energy emerging from the ground in a particular area of the ground, which is what we call a chakra pattern on the ground, very much the same way that one has chakra patterns in the bioenergy fields of humans. We are just like the, the Earth. We are built just like the Earth from the energy point of view. And in fact, it is this interaction of this energy with ourselves that gives us the second effect of stone circles. This is not just the geophysics, it's also the biophysics. And so when we start to analyze stone circles, we're not just looking at it from the archaeological point of view. Now we have to consider it from both the geophysical point of view as well as the biophysical point of view. And so we're bringing together the interaction of the energy, these earth energies, on the humans themselves. So this is why humans have a response to it from a conscious point of view, but it also affects the physical body in many ways. In particular, it is now possible to not only measure changes in brainwave patterns, which are a neurological correlate, you might say, of consciousness effects, but it's also possible to measure changes, for example, in the hormonal level in individuals and the changes in the hormones are truly a, a reflection of the interaction of these earth energies with the biophysics of the person involved. One always talks about this energy being electromagnetic in nature and in fact the first attempt to explain dowsing generally was on the basis of electromagnetic theory but in fact when you start to analyze it it's not sufficient 
in its own right. It does not explain everything. You have to look a little bit at the history of how ele our understanding, man's understanding of electromagnetics developed, which again was classical 19th century physics. And it was really started to evolve in the 1860s thereabouts. But the original ideas were somewhat untidy and it took about 25 years to, let's say, clean up this whole idea of electromagnetics. And that's the version, the cleaned up version, is the version we teach to our students today. And they're absolutely superb for designing mobile phones and electrical equipment and things like that. But what's happened is, in this tidying up process of the original electromagnetic theory, we've thrown the baby out with the bathwater. In fact, when you look back to the original theories of Clark Maxwell, who really developed this from a mathematical point of view, he had all sorts of other parameters in his equations. And it's these other parameters that we are now investigating in great detail because these appear to have quite a lot of linkage with the sort of effects that we're really talking about. They appear to have certainly linkage with consciousness and biophysics. During the 1990s, when physicists started to look again at this whole theory of consciousness, which hadn't really been studied for about a hundred years, to be perfectly honest, New ideas in this wonderful field of quantum theory, which are rather obscure and rather difficult to understand, started to be applied to possible biological systems. And in fact, it seemed at the time to start to explain one or two effects in perhaps how the brain might possibly work in terms of how information might jump across neurons within the brain. And in fact, since then, during the 1990s, a whole new range of experiments have taken place. And the crucial one here, for all of the stuff that we're talking about now, is this way in which quantum particles, once having been together and then being separated, still appear to be linked to one another. In other words, if you have two particles together, and it doesn't really matter what subatomic particles you're talking about, when they were originally entangled, use the correct expression, then you separate them and you do something to one particle, the other particle responds almost immediately. In fact, virtually immediately, we can't tell the, the difference. These two appear to be one particle or other separated. And this is a quantum effect called non-locality. And it's this sort of way in which consciousness works. And the everyday description of this is perhaps how one might talk about identical twins and how they have very common ideas and do things at the same time and think about things in the same way. So at one time being linked together as one cell and being separated apparently independently but then they seem to operate as one despite the distance apart. And this quantum non-local effect is something that we're applying very seriously to these ideas in consciousness. So it is really a descriptor of the mind. Such that now we're talking about, uh, at least modern science is talking about the brain being the mind. And there's an awful lot of confusion about this brain and the mind. But what we are looking at now is the idea that this is the brain, but in fact the mind is truly out there. And this is a very ancient idea. And it is coming back again that this universe in which we live is in fact a mind in its own right and we are just one element within that universe. The idea that there was a universal field is, as I said, is a very ancient idea and indeed this kept going as a, a concept well into the 19th century. And it was only really in the beginning of the 20th century when we started to look at new ideas in so-called relativity theory, modern ideas of gravity, that the equations of Einstein suggested that perhaps we didn't need the idea of some universal ether or some universal field. And in fact, you do not need that concept to be able to solve his equations. And therefore, the idea that this universal field existed fell out of fashion. But lots of things happened in the quantum theory field which suggested that we do, in fact, always have what we call a zero-point energy field or a vacuum field. It goes under all sorts of different names. But there is a universal field there. And this is what I call the modern quantum idea of an ether. And it's this quantum field that the consciousness of the individual interacts with. And that's the current model that we're using. Well, the key thing about this field is that, uh, in fact, it is a self-organizing field. What I mean by that is patterns of nature emerge. 
So that if you look at a flower, for example, and you see all these wonderful petals, six and five fold petals, you find those same patterns, six five fold patterns, geometrical patterns in the earth. If you start to look at things on a global basis, you're talking about uh, shapes of things to do with the solar system, you still find the same numbers there. Or you can go to galaxies and you still find the same numbers there. And you can talk about some of the modern ideas in which the, the universe is expanded from the Big Bang. All of these same numbers still emerge, such that the whole of the universe looks very much like the, the idea of Russian dolls, whereby we have one universal shape and we can put a smaller version inside that and then a smaller version inside that and a smaller version inside that one such that we can start with really big stuff and end up with the small scale stuff. So, and this fitting of patterns with inside patterns being essentially the same pattern is what we call fractals. And this fractal geometry we now know applies to the whole of nature. And in fact we're beginning to understand how this applies as a concept even to the ideas of consciousness and thought such that it truly is a universal pattern. But when we're talking about other shapes and patterns we find in stone circles, the, the key one is perhaps the, the spiral. Everybody finds spirals. And once you have a spiral, it has a true mathematical shape. Uh, in fact, one of the key patterns you find at stone circles, believe it or not, has precisely the same structure as the DNA molecule with precisely the same angles in it. And when the whole structure of the DNA genome, the whole structure of the DNA molecule, was finally worked out, it was discovered to be precisely the same as the 64 hexagram code of the I Ching that the Chinese had invented 5000 BC. And it's these patterns that we're now starting to find emerging in our studies of consciousness itself. And we can use dowsing to enable us to generate these self-same numbers. Dowsing has always been thought of as something of a qualitative type activity, but in fact it isn't. There's an awful lot of quantitative data in dowsing that really reveals the equations of physics within it. Mainstream science at the moment is still some way away from accepting these ideas, but what is quite surprising is that as I talk to more and more people lots more individuals are beginning to latch on to these connections. And my gut feeling is, in the next generation, a new set of graduates will in fact adopt a totally different attitude, and I think will begin to absorb some of these ideas. And in fact, the true linkages throughout science will finally be brought together. And that doesn't really matter whether we're talking about matter itself, or whether we're talking about mind, should begin to understand that essentially, from a structural point of view, they're all the same thing. In our exploration of these sites, the Spirit of the Serpent team follows traditions similar to some of the Soviet research, in that we combine traditional scientific methods with some a little bit more esoteric and metaphysical. Julie Soskin likes to be called a sensitive. Some call her a psychic or a medium. Unlike others in our team, Julie's life path seemed mapped out from a very young age. I used to be able to sometimes hear what people were thinking and I used to repeat it. Um, it did not win me friends or influence people at all. In fact, on the whole, people were spooked by it. And um, I had an aunt who used to call me that very strange girl, that strange girl. Um, so it, uh, it has its pluses and its minuses. It wasn't until my early 20s that I realised that I could do what um, I'm naturally gifted to do as a profession, as it were. It never occurred to me that I would be a sensitive, a psychic. Uh, I didn't know such a thing existed. Um, but in a sense, I can say yes, because I've always been intuitive. I've always had very strong senses about people and what they're thinking and feeling. Um, energy follows thought, so where you put your thoughts, your intention, your energy goes and you can tune into it, much like a radio station. You can go through the different channels and different awareness. I'm particularly interested in the personal development aspect of it, how people progress spiritually through their own senses, through their own experiences. 
Um, and at some point in that spiritual journey, people do become conscious of their innate intuitive faculties. And when they do, the consciousness increases um, a great deal. So the spiritual development speeds up radically at that point. So I see intuition and spiritual growth as being hand in hand. It comes at a point in people's life where they suddenly realize there must be something more to life than this. That's the usual quote that people give. And by that, it means that that person realizes that it's not just the physical world that we belong to. They may have some kind of psychic experience. They may have a spiritual experience. They may have some kind of unexplained experience that just triggers something within that individual that makes them start looking or makes them become aware of something other than the physical. And that starts a journey. And it is a spiritual journey. It is a self-spiritual journey because it's wound around the individual as well and their progress. I, I kind of fell, fell in it. I went and had healing um, because I'd had a, an operation and a neighbor said, go and see a healer. I didn't know what a healer was. I went and had heal, healing and the healer said to me, I should be in a development group. I didn't know what a development group was, but I joined this group and it had a profound effect on me. Um, not least of all, because I found that I wasn't going mad because as a teenager particularly I used to pick up so much of other people's stuff that the lines were blurred between what was mine and what were what was other people's and there was a point when I was about 19 where I wondered if I was actually completely sane um, Thank God I didn't go to a psychiatrist because they might have locked me up. Some might argue that they should have done. But um, when I started meditating and started developing properly, I was able to be in control of my energies for the first time in my life. So it had a, a very profound effect on me. Um, I actually had no particular interest in being a medium at that point. But the development process, the meditation, the experiential exercises alerted me to the fact that it was actually making me a better person. Now, better person, I mean someone who is more in control of their life, someone who is more aware, who is functioning better, who is actually more healthy. I literally became more healthy physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually and it was out of that that I first realized that there was something very profound in this development process I mean for hundreds and thousands of years you've had priests laying on of hands and um, directing that energy what is different now is that people have realized that you don't need to be a priest to do that that anyone can do it and indeed um, we all heal our family, our friends, by opening up to them, by listening to them, by being with them, by touching them lovingly. The healing is going on all the time. Somebody who hasn't had some kind of experience, some experiential um, sense, they would they would rationalize it and if you rationalize it you can't make sense of it it's a bit like me saying to you um i'm in love and you would accept the fact that i was in love and if if you couldn't accept you'd say prove it to me well of course i couldn't prove it to you in any logical sense but we know that love exists we know that it's there uh, intuition spirituality is the same thing it exists it's, it's there but it can't be known by the rational mind in itself. There's different layers and levels of psychism. Um, there's um, what you might call an instinctual level. And there's no question in my mind that those th things like the stones were put there as an instinct, they were instinctual about it. So if you want to call that intuition, yes it is. Mar Russell was a physiotherapist when she met Hamish. She'd always been involved with healing, but for the last 20 years, things had taken on a rather different focus. The little local um, 
hospital called St Michael's, funnily enough, run by some nuns, were desperate for a physio. And uh, I found my car dowsing its way into the yard. And I said, if you can't find anybody else, I would be prepared to just hold the fort for a little while. And um, so I started to work, which is good because I became then integrated on my own. Well, I think all physios deep down are healers because we don't use any medications. We literally just use natural, the sun. In fact, on our badge, we've got the sun and the hands, and that's all we use. So it really followed on very much from there. Um, and when I joined Hamish, he was well into healing. And it was just a natural thing. The qualities of a healer, um, I think that they have to realize that although they've got this gift, it isn't really them. And they have to realize with, um, with humbleness in a way that they are lucky to be used. But everybody is, is, can be a healer. But some people are more motivated, is really the word, to do it and they just feel drawn. If they see somebody in pain, they're just drawn to help them. So, um, but the great thing is to learn that um, it is just not, it's not your own ego trip. It is, the energy comes through you and through your hands and through your whole body and the way you, you conduct yourself. Before you heal, first of all, you ask whether it is applicable because some people have problems, um, maybe for a learning, not necessarily for them, but for the people around them. So you always ask, may I heal first? And then if the answer you feel is, is yes, you get that answer yes, you tune in and ask for the healing energy to come through you and be used in the way that it should be used because if the ego's there we might see a bad leg and you think oh we'll heal that leg but it may be that there's something else within that body that needs to be healed first and we don't know that um, so we just leave that energy to go where it needs to go and then it goes in the right order we really just boost them. They do the healing and we give them that boost with which um, it makes it much more um, possible. I don't think one needs to understand the mechanics, how healing works. Almost, I think, it gets in the way. Um, there's a very famous healer, that um, Matthew Manning, and I can remember him saying that the, the least you know the more it comes through because you don't then put your own ideas in. Again, the old ego comes in and you inadvertently, without realizing it, try to direct it in the way you think. Um, it, in that respect, my physio training was quite a hindrance because I looked at it with two hats on sometimes and I had to be quite stern and just shut that scientific view out sometimes. You ask uh, permission from the guardian before you enter. It's a mental thing, really. Or you can say it out loud, it doesn't matter, because both are the same, but you mentally or, or physically speak and say, may I enter? In fact, this happens in many, many different cultures. If you go on to a, a marae in New Zealand, you all, you, before you're allowed on, you have to say why you're going, where you've come from, all in song there. I started dowsing, it must be now about, ooh, 15, 16, perhaps more years ago, when um, Hamish came and gave me a pair of dowsing rods for Christmas and just said, go out and find the most energetic spot in this room. And I thought, what a funny question, but if he's asking me, it must be possible, so I didn't doubt it and doused and my rods went round and I was told, yep, that's it. And you are never the same again. Once that happens and you find the rod moving in your hand and you know that it's not you, you never look at the world again in the same way, ever. Next, it was my turn. I lead people on walking parties, really, and treks around the world. 
teaching people how to be more in tune with nature. That's been the main part of my work for a long time now. And archaeology has been an aspect of that. How man has always communicated with nature and the environment. So that's a big passion of mine. Has been for a long time, since I was tiny. Always had a passion for wildlife and uh, just being outdoors, really. And the more my skills developed, if you like, with, uh, with healing and sensing subtle energy, sensing movements of energy uh, in, a, in a healing environment, and I became more and more aware of being aware of those movements of energy when I was outdoors, whether it was interacting with animals or just um, you know, rocks and plants or anything else. Everything has this energetic flow going on, on all sorts of different levels. It can even be the movement of air that people just don't notice half the time, you know, the gentle breeze, and, and we filter things out. And um, I've been enjoying that for myself for a, a long time, and after however long it dawned on me that other people might actually enjoy coming out and experiencing that as well. I've done everything from leading walking parties to, uh, well, places like the Merry Maidens where we've been working, um, all across Dartmoor, for example, where there's such a wealth of, uh, of archaeolo undisturbed archaeological uh, sites to be explored. But right the way through to I have taken people to spend time with the Coggy Indians, for example, in uh, the jungles of northern Colombia, where there, you know, there's a race of people who actually have always lived in harmony with their environment. And I felt that we had a lot that we could learn from them as well about that aspect of, of living in harmony with, uh, with nature and having a respect for the earth and, and all those aspects. They regard themselves as the guardians of the planet, basically. That's their whole kind of religious take. And uh, they live in complete harmony with their environment. And they came out of hiding in the late 70s. Came out of hiding. Nobody knew they were there, really. But they came out just to tell the rest of the planet that uh, you guys have got to stop doing what you're doing because it's not us that's messing all this up. Yes, I think when you when you look at, at ancient sites um, and whether ancient man was was actually aware of any energetic aspects, patterns maybe going on, you know, what was he actually working with or what was driving him to do what he did? Uh, I think it's uh, it's such a broad spectrum. There are sites that I think are purely functional, and there are others that are deeply sacred. You can look at sites around the world. Uh, for example, uh, if you look at Henry Lincoln's work in uh, in the Pyrenees or around the Rennes Chateau area, where there are ancient I'm not going to say artifacts, but there are buildings, there are standing stones, uh, calvaires, which are little sacred sites dotted around the place, markers, that are actually positioned around the landscape to pinpoint accuracy of, of geometries, absolutely pinpoint accuracy. And the thing is, they're not within the line of sight. You can have mountains in between. So these, particularly when it comes to the standing stones, the people of the time, whether it's Neolithic, Early Bronze Age, some of them are older than that. Some of them could be um, even Paleolithic. So, you know, older than, um, well, I mean, just thousands of years old. It doesn't matter what the time frame is. The point is that, uh, that these guys were intuitively putting things, even if they weren't aware of it, they just put something where they felt that it belonged. And the fact that when, when people work with that degree of, uh, of intuition, that they're placing things so accurately in relation to each other, that, uh, yes, I think that they were aware of it sometimes, but very often not at all. And, of course, you'll al always get other sites as well where we put our emotional stamp on, on the site as well. You know, we see a stone circle and it looks enigmatic and mysterious, 
because it's a circle of stones. When there's all sorts of sites dotted around the place that actually would have been surrounded by wooden walls, they would have been covered structures and if if we now looked at a structure like that it would just be a building and we wouldn't think that it was anything mysterious at all so you know there's a there's a very broad spectrum of uh, of you know whether it was intuitively and mystically motivated or if it was just a functional structure we put quartz in our watches because we know how it's going to behave when you put an electrical current through them we know that well if you take any crystalline structure it doesn't necessarily have to be crystalline, but you take any mineral structure that um, that has that that kind of integrity. And if you pass any kind of of energy through it, and it can be tiny, you know, you you can't uh, escape the fact that every cell in our body is functioning on, even though it's minute, on an electrical and chemical uh, basis that you bring a subtle energy into something else that has that, that kind of structure and things are going to happen. You're going to be picking things up. Now, maybe there's an intelligence there, but maybe there isn't. Maybe it's just the interaction of that energy that is actually invoking something else within the individual. Um, and it's just, it's always, it's questioning that. It's always looking at that. You know, what do I really believe? What do I really feel is going on here? Not do, what do I want to be happening here, but what do I honestly feel is happening here? Understandably, there's a, a huge lack of understanding about what energy actually means. And I think when you hear whether it's psychics or healers or dowsers or whatever, talking about energy. They can feel this energy. Basically, if something is affecting you, if you can step into something and you feel different, or with a dowser, if he can step into something and these things that he's holding in his hands do something that, that he's not controlling, then... If you, if you look at the, the literal meaning of energy that is just the capacity for movement and change, well, if, if something external to you is making you feel different or making something that you're holding behave differently, then that is it's a, an energy that is doing that thing. What it is, is... It's a huge question because there are so many different aspects of energy. You know, is it magnetic energy? Is it electrical energy? Is it electromagnetic energy? Uh, is it um, is it something like a chemical stimulus that actually creates a cascade within the brain that does something else? Uh, th there's all sorts of things that will uh, that will have effects, and we call them all energy because energy is simply the capacity for movement and change. Anything that makes something move or makes something change is energetic. Now is the first ever episode of The Spirit of the Serpent, an exploration into earth energies of the Merry Maiden Stone Circle in Cornwall, southwest England. The programme is presented by Claire Grogan. Welcome to another two days serpenteering. This week we're at the Merry Maidens, which are just outside of Penzance in Cornwall, England. We're here to find out more about these fantastic stones and just why on earth they were put here thousands of years ago. What effect can entering a sacred site have on the human body? Is the peaceful atmosphere more than just our imagination? And will we find any of the mysterious symbolic shapes often created by earth energy? By using a combination of metaphysics and traditional science, we'll try to understand the flow of energy that surrounds the site, as well as learn more about what our ancestors knew when they built the circle. All our regular teams here, Hamish and Ba, are mapping out the energy flow with those lethal-looking but trusty dowsing rods of theirs. Rupert's been finding out more about the local folklore. 
Julia Sensitive is quietly communing with the stones, of course. And here's Jim, our rock of scientific sanity, in amongst all this metaphysics madness. So, Jim, what have you got planned for us this week? Well, we have two or three experiments uh, for us this week. And uh, the first one is a very simple one, which is aimed at measuring the energy coming from the stone circle. We have a second one, which is measuring the effect of the energy from the circle on you uh -huh. or me. And the third one is really a slightly cleverer one, which really measures how people are learning to douse. We can measure the brainwave reaction as a result of dowsing. Well, just what this circle of stone will reveal to us over the next two days is anyone's guess. When the team arrived here, the first thing they did was to gently familiarise themselves with the circle. And I always feel I have to ask, because it's a very... It's like going in a cathedral. No, you can't turn your back on it once you're in. It's very comfortable there, but I find it uncomfortable here. I think there are patches where you feel quite disorientated. The discomfort is, is perfectly logical because there's so much. Yes, there uh, is. So many different yes, frequencies of energy around. Is. You're bound to hit one that, that gets yes. you in the gut. It's also very powerful, so when you get powerful energy, it can feel quite yeah. disorientating anyway. Yeah, mm. it seems to be getting excited about what we're doing. Yeah, I felt <laughs> that too as we yeah. came in. Yeah. It, it's like, yeah. oh goody. Later, I was keen to find out what the team wanted to achieve here. Now you guys have had the chance to get to know the site a bit. I've watched you all pacing around, touching stones, doing weird things with washing lines, <laughs> or what it looks like to me. <laughs> I mean, what's, what's everyone's expectations? And this one in particular, I'm looking for uh, the energy centre in the circle, which will not be in the centre. It'll be offset. And I hope to find from that there's radials of energy coming out to the stones. These subtle energies are are all different and all different sites and they're bands of different energies. They have a different effect and a way of thinking and a behaviour. And that's why we have to find out a lot more about it. And what's it going to tell us though about the people that that erected these stones? Hopefully we're going to try and get into their mindset. But that's the difficult thing because we don't it's four thousand years old, but it may have started long before that as a sacred site. It may have gradually built when they started realising just how important this place was. Mm -hmm. And as they worked with it, the, the odd thing is that the, the earth energy seems to respond to consciousness. Now, Jim, are you agreeing with any of this? Pretty much so, really. I, I follow on, in a way, from where Hamish leads off, because I'm interested in taking this idea of all these energy fields, we call them subtle energy fields, and seeing how all this lot relates to mainstream science. I really sort of come with a scientific viewpoint, but I, I've got this gut feeling that somehow it's very strongly linked to all this ancient stuff. Rupert, I read somewhere in the research notes that it's got something to do with women being punished for having a good time. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Something along yes. those lines. Yes. The original uh, story was that these were the maidens who uh, were turned to stone for daring to dance on a Sabbath. That's a common myth across the country. Now, Julie... <laughs> <laughs> I've seen you touching them, mm -hmm. practically hugging them. <laughs> <laughs> it's got a very touchy-feely thing going on. I'm trying to attune to them to see if they can speak to me, as it were. Not literally like you and me, mm -hmm. but give, give me a sense. I, I work with subtle energies, so I get a sense of what might have been there. And the overriding feeling for me is one of love, actually. Um, there's a lot of care that has gone into these stones. I think all down the age, it's a very happy place. Mm. You know, you can't help but feel there's definitely something going on, yeah. but I'm still not convinced that it, it's not just a nice picnic spot, you Hamish. Be, you will be. <laughs> but I'm happy to be proven wrong. <laughs> Next, Hamish set about dowsing to find the power centre and the major earth energy lines that enter and lead the circle. Where they cross will be the energy centre of the whole circle. Yes. Can you stick that in? Yep. I'll keep that as a permanent marker because I'll have to use the earth energy as weeds like a river. It's such a complex thing. They join in with the next ones coming in, like big arteries coming together and into the mainstream around the world. And then out to the cosmos. <laughs> That's coming right through that gap. This is uh, This is the controversial one. Because I think there should be a stone there, actually. But then people argue that it should only be 19 because it's related to the moon. I don't know. But anyway, that that uh, energy line, they may have allowed for that, this, this line coming in. That's a possibility. Hamish had his own idea about the gap in the circle, but we'd find out later that some of the team had different ideas. 
Each each of these uh, lines has a number of, of lines within it, and uh, they will be going in different directions, probably feeding in and and coming out. So we'll just check. And actually, all you have to do is ask. And that one is feeding that way. And the next one is that way. They are different frequencies. They are uh, male, female, uh, positive, ne negative, or yin yang, or whatever. But there are differences in, in these lines, and they're feeding different energy, in, and it's going through that stone. And that stone will react to this energy, but it's not dependent on it because it has its own um, energy center and its own function, and it's related to the, to the uh, center. Every uh, power center has a vortex around it and uh, straight radials coming out like the spokes of a bicycle wheel and they will tie up from here from this power center to each individual stone because I think that's what the ancients were marking because the, um, they didn't necessarily start with, with 20 they may have started with half a dozen stones just marking the odd radial coming out but as it develops in, in ceremony the whole uh, system seems to develop and the earth responds to what people are doing in the ceremony. This is the controversial one where I think there's a stone missing and they're never evenly spaced because they very often bunch where there's a, an energy line feeding in. I think the radials were here originally coming from the energy center because there are hundreds of, of uh, cases of power centers which are not marked by stones which have radials. And uh, I think the function of this thing is, by the old people, is to mark where these radials are. Because it's part of, a, of their sacred temple, if you like. But the hugely important part of it is to make a permanent record of the, the basic number of radials coming out of this, this center. So the full treatment would, would have 20 radials coming out. The 20 going, 20th going through the space. There's no other way to find these except by dowsing. Japanese are developing some equipment that hopefully will do the job that I'm doing in more accurately. On the other hand, I think if I put a little meter on the top with numbers on it, people would believe this thing. <laughs> Number three. <laughs> the lines of earth energy Hamish was finding fitted perfectly with what Jim, our academic, was expecting. But all the numbers that you find associated with all these alignments of stones are related to the good old Platonic solids of Greek geometry. You can find out all sorts of angles from that, and you find all those angles, believe it or not, in stone circles. And an absolute classic example of this uh, in terms of Earth energies is volcanoes. Volcanoes are distributed according to very specific rules. And a wonderful example is Easter Island. And there are three dormant volcanoes on Easter Island, and they form a beautiful angle. Uh, with an angle of, believe it or not, 109.471 degrees. That can be as specific as that, and it really does align with that. It all comes from the simplest of the Platonic solids, the tetrahedron. And that's the angle that you find just about everywhere in Earth energies. These lines gradually get closer together the nearer you go to the centre of the circle. And in fact, this whole thing follows a very precise mathematical rule called uh, geometric series and we find this absolutely everywhere in earth energies. Well, the distance from the center of these uh, stones to this edge line here is about 33 and a half inches or around about 2.72 feet and when Alexander Tom, an engineer who was a uh, Cambridge professor, he analyzed something like 900 stone circles throughout the UK and this figure of 2.72 feet kept coming up time and time and time again and he called it the megalithic yard because it's as near as damn to a yard. And it's stayed with us ever since. And the academic world really doesn't believe in this number. But in fact, what I've done recently is analyzed the geophysics of the Earth in terms of magnetic field and gravitational field. And when you start to look at the balance between the energies, a characteristic length comes out of these equations. And that length is precisely 2.72 feet. All these stone circles have seemed to have eight concentric circles of energy around the stones. They start, uh, Jim says it's a megalithic yard just outside, and then they gradually come in. And I thought that was a sort of protection thing, but it's not really. I, th I think it's uh, 
almost a sensor. And when you come in, in, you cross this in the right frame of mind to, to accept what's happening inside, the whole thing switches on to the consciousness that's working in it. One of the things about stone circles is there's always an anomaly in the magnetic field. Generally speaking, the magnetic field inside a stone circle is slightly less by about one or two percent compared with that outside. And also, the other thing is the magnetic field is variable, and you can find this very easily with a simple map compass. Uh, but generally, this particular stone circle is pretty smooth. But in fact, there's a small area just over here, which is in fact anomalous. And uh, I'm, I've got this aligned to north, but as I uh, moved into this sort of region, round about these two stones here, relatively small region, it smoothly swings by about 30 degrees. So there's a 30 degree anomaly in the position of north. Well, that was much earlier today. Hamish, there looks like there's an awful lot going on here. <laughs> there surely is. There's been a lot doing, but this is, this, we've just managed to do the, the, the sort of bare necessities of, of showing what's been happening in, in this energy centre. Now, I've yeah. seen you do this a few times. How on earth can I believe that it's all for real? It's difficult to say. I, I, I can't actually prove this is happening. There's no other way of finding this. And it's such a subtle energy. There's no way of finding it without um, a dowsing rod. What we're finding is, is absolutely astonishing. You can see what happens and all these radials, straight radials coming out through the stones. We've got spirals. And, and it's all meeting in the centre. It's there. all meeting in the centre. It's all happening in the centre. That's the simplest thing in the centre. We've, we've got experiments to do in the centre which are... Oh, <laughs> Mind blowing. You've got a lot more to do, clearly. I, I better leave you to it then. <laughs> Thank you very <All> right. much. <laughs> we'll leave Hamish to finish off here while he's still got some light, and we'll find out later on in the show what else he discovers. Coming up, Julie, our sensitive, will tell us what she's been picking up on, and we're going to learn a little more about the folklore and legend from Rupert. Yeah, it's fine. Great. I think we'll call it a day. I, don't know. Oh, I think so. <laughs> yep, a day. Oh. Shall we take the road and no, uh, leave that? No, okay. no, no. It's day two of our exploration into the earth energies here at the Merry Maidens in Cornwall and here with me now is Rupert Siliskin. He's been delving into all the wonderful stories that surround this site. Now Rupert, not even I believe that these were <laughs> misbehaving maidens that were turned into stone, but it does indicate that our ancestors have been keen to find some kind of explanation for them. It's really interesting that every different age has its, its own type of story that goes with it and the early church was was very good at saying that uh, you know anybody who did anything bad on the Sabbath, would, this would be what happened to them. There's, uh, there's a nice story in Saxon mythology that 936 AD that uh, this is actually the battlefield uh, where King Athelstan beat the Cornish King Howell. Clearly it's, it's not true. We know that the site's 4,000 years old. Yeah. And is there something deliberate going on in terms of the pattern and the size? And If you look at the site side on, then you get small stones on either side and go to larger in the middle. So it's echoing the sweep yeah. of the, st the sun and the planets in I the sky. I hadn't noticed that before, but I can see that. It's, it, it is very interesting. But when you think that those, those alignments could take a long, long time to actually get accurate. So they would have started, they might have mar marked it out with wood to begin with, and then progressively added the stones when they were happy with, uh, with where the alignment had to go. And has anyone in, in recent times tried to remove them? I mean, when I say in recent times, you know, in the last couple of hundred <laughs> it, years? Yes, it was repaired in the 1860s. So uh, it was probably very clear at the time where the stones came from, you know, holes in the ground where they'd fallen over. So they're probably quite accurately placed. It's believed to be very accurately placed. Mm -hmm. But then it was vandalised in the 1980s when uh, some clowns came along and actually tried to nick the stones, I think. <laughs> and interestingly, they found out when they actually put it back together yeah. again, they found that the st one of the stones had been put the wrong way round when they repaired it they'd actually put it the wrong way around and that makes you wonder how many of the stones have been put the wrong way around yeah. you know if they is there a relevance to the fact that it was originally maybe at 90 degrees you know that's quite do interesting do you think we'll ever it? really know the answers to these questions not really no <laughs> are you going to show me these other <laughs> yeah, stones yeah let's go and have a look at this stone here it is so they were dragged over here for a more practical use yeah, it was a very common thing that the farmers would just rip the stones out of the fields because it was much easier than going 
find them from somewhere else, just take them out of the site. There's a lovely story actually associated, associated with this site. In, in 1907, a farmer from England came and, and bought the land here and, and thought the field would be more valuable without the stones in it. So they tethered up the, uh, the horses. The lead horse, when they dragged one stone out, the lead horse reared up and dropped dead uh, when they'd pulled the stone out of the ground. And they thought that was deeply mysterious. So they put the stone back in and left the circle alone. But it's probably just the oldest horse on the farm that uh, had a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> and what about this horse? Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. It's something you, you do see a reasonable amount. It's possible that uh, it could have been a sighting stone, you know, that the sun at a particular time of year maybe shone through and, and marked a spot, or it could have been a sighting stone that you could see through to a specific point. You know, we don't actually know. Should we go back and see what the others are up to? So Hamish, is it really, is the earth really crackling for you underneath? The it earth looks is like it. Pulsing. Can you, I mean, so much has happened here, that, and you can see the, the the start of it is that we found out that there are there are twenty radials like the spokes of the wheel coming out from each stone. Each stone. Each stone, and then each stone has a a separate uh, spiral around it. The radials go right out from way out from the stones, but they don't interfere with each other because they're different frequencies. These are the, the, the main radials we've been able to find and there are 20 of these, one to each stone. Mm -hmm. And then they go in towards the centre and there's a massive spiral at the centre. And I've marked it with the orange uh, stuff. And, and does it feel like a positive energy? It's image? very positive. It's, it's, oh, it's, <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's a beautiful balanced feel, you see. This is, this is just the earth. It's a sort of heartbeat or a, or a, a little synapse in the earth which is just pulsing away here and, and waiting for something really important to happen. You can see the, the wee spiral here starts. Right. And actually, it goes much tighter. The, the rope's too wide. It starts with a tiny little spiral and it comes... Really and then it starts to come out here. And this is the one that, if you start playing with it, it'll, it'll either wind up or, or wind out. We'll do it. We'll do some muscle testing. and It, it actually affects you. If you uh -huh. step off it and then step back onto it, you can muscle test. All right. To do that, we need Jim, who specialises in this sort of thing. All right, Jim, well, what are you going to do? What we need to do is to move away, first of all, from the centre here. So just let me find a suitable spot for you to come to. Okay. Just stand there with your arm out. Just all right. And I want you there. I just want you to resist. Me. Okay. Okay. All Strong right. as you like. Pretty good. Nice. Pretty good. Uh huh. What we're going to do now is move to the power centre. Okay. And then repeat the exercise. Just stand. Just stand similar way, but one foot either side of that. Just like this? Yeah, just like that. Just perhaps a little bit further forward. A bit further forward, yeah. Okay. The arm up like that. Okay. Okay. Ready? Shoulder height. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you see, I think you took me by surprise a bit. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'd like to try that again, yeah. if you don't mind. Yeah. And oh. I'll concentrate on resisting yeah. this time. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is that then? How is <laughs> what that? is it then? <laughs> yes, that's it. What else have you got up your sleeves, well, boys? It, obviously, this is a very special place. Uh -huh. And there's something uh, quite dramatic has happened since we started working on it, because it's manifested another shape. You're feeling it? Yeah. Just since we've there been is, here yeah, talking about it? I've just asked it? If, it's, if there's anything else here. Well, and I think it's trying to communicate with us, because it's just created this thing. But what's it trying to say here? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see but what's happening. I can show you what the shape is. And, I, and Bob could probably mark it with this. This very fair. highly technological system we have <laughs> with these little candles. Yeah. I can see how it's coming out. Can you? Yes, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. This is rather a wonderful pattern you call Lemniscate of Benui. Now this round here is 4000 whatever it is BC. Right. This is 17th century mathematics. So it just goes to show you, it took all that time before we were able to describe these patterns in mathematical right. form. Yeah. And that's one shape of a whole class of patterns in that shape, which apply to all sorts of stone circles. Are you excited by this, guys? I've got shivers all down my <laughs> <again>. <laughs> Yeah. The power centre had shown as a symbol like an infinity sign. It was exciting, but I was still puzzled by how Hamish finds these things by dowsing. Jim, is there a scientific way that we could get a feel or measure what's happening inside of Hamish's head, I guess, <laughs> while he's dozing. Well, we can certainly have a look at that. We have some new devices that enable us to look at his brain wave patterns. In the same way we're looking at the Earth patterns, we can look at his brain wave patterns at the same time. 
Really and we'll good. just see what happens. All right, you're going to go and get that set Absolutely, up I'll go and do that right now. All right, well, Jim's okay. setting up that very exciting experiment. I'm going to go off and have a word with Julie, our sensitive. So here you are, Julie, and I've noticed that you've been feeling particularly sensitive towards this stone. Um, from the moment that I entered this circle, um, this, uh, this stone and this one drew me straight away. Why do you call yourself a sensitive? I expected you to be running around with a box of tissues all the time going, I'm terribly <laughs> sensitive. <laughs> it seemed quite sturdy to me though. <laughs> I use the word sensitive, the name sensitive, rather than psychic or clairvoyant because unfortunately both those words have got negative connotations. Yes, I am psychic. Yes, I do tune into unseen forces, but I'm not a fortune teller. No. Um, you can't read my mind, can you? <sighs> oh, she can. I can tell by that look <laughs> on her face. I'll have to be very careful about what Only I'm if I'm asked. Ah, right. You mm. would just tune into that yes. the way you tune into yes. the, to the mind of yes. these stones. I and suppose. everyone can attune to energies. Mm. That's the point. What I'm finding about all of them is I don't feel nearly as reverential as I thought I might feel right. towards them. I do feel that these stones were put here as a form of respect mm -hmm. to the universe. There is definitely a connection between the earth and the cosmos in these stones. I feel personally that they have a strong connection to the moon. So does each stone have a different personality? I'd prefer not to use the word personality. It, they certainly do have a different quality, a different energy. I think the trouble is we do tend to personify these things and I don't know that that's exactly how it is. Mm -hmm. uh, they do have a different energy. This one to me is very much the communication stone. There does seem to be quite a lot of sort of negative stories attached to places like th this. I think, to be perfectly honest, I think some of that is fear. And the, the other interesting thing for me, linking energetically with them, is of course they have been here for thousands of years, so there's a lot to link into. Mm -hmm. And I've had mental images come to me, people dancing here, and it may have been considered by some section of the society that maybe they were too out of control. There was too much fun going too on. Too much fun. So Julie, what other kind of mental pictures are you coming up with? I do feel there has been some ritualistic work done here, but it didn't seem at all sinister. Maybe something like a marriage. The kind of the purpose of this site has changed over the years? I think it has changed a bit. I think it was set up as a sacred space to create uh, a vortex of energy, a powerful place. I think the stones like people coming to them. Well, I'll leave you to carry on your chat. If you come up with any thank interesting you revelations, do let us know. I will. <laughs> right, thank you, Julie. Yeah. Next, it was time to have a peek inside the mysterious workings of Hamish's brain. <laughs> this is definitely a bit of a nutty professor moment, Jim. <laughs> now, what's happening here? Well, what we're trying to do is measure his brainwave patterns. And you see these things on his head here, two on his forehead here, and indeed there's an electrode behind each ear. And we're measuring the response of both his brain brain patterns here, right brain, left brain. And what we're going to do is put Hamish in a meditative state, that means he calms down. And in that situation we expect his brain waves to drop from around 15 cycles a second down to about two or three cycles a second. And then he will go into a dowsy mode. And what okay. we expect and we hope will happen is that this low frequency will suddenly jump up to around 10 cycles a second then we know he's gone into this very concentrated Constant. thought pattern. Mm. So, shall we try it? Yes. Here's the fun bit. <laughs> oh, God. Jim, <laughs> Jim, can I just clarify, that is a raincoat that you're under, That's yes? Absolutely There's nothing right. scientific about nothing scientific that about <laughs> covering. What okay. Ever. We're just trying to see the screen for start. I'm ready to start, Hamish. I'll just go into a quiet mode now. Okay. Ready. Steady, go. Oh, 
I've done it. Yes, we've managed to detect Hamish in the meditative mode quite well. There's more activity in that side than there is in that side. Well, I'm very pleased and that, that is the intuitive side. Yeah. And that's the lo Good. logical side. And then what would you find is that when you went into the dowsing mode, yeah. you had a very strong pattern around 10 cycles a second. Really? And that is precisely where I would expect the response to be. So when Hamish dowses, it seems the right side of his brain takes over and he gets results by using his intuition rather like Julie. Our two days were nearly over, but Rupert had found another connection with the gap in the circle. Now this looks like a monument to me. It, it feels like a monument as well. It seems very different to what's going on over there, and yet you think they're connected. Absolutely connected. If, you know, if, again, imagine the, all these field walls out of the way, the way the landscape would have been. And yeah. This is actually on a, an east-west line, straight through the circle. And where there's a big gap in the circle, this, you know, this just lines up. Where with the missing that. stone yeah. is meant yeah. to have been. So you know, it does give you that that sense that you know it is part of that. Maybe it's a sunrise sunset line that they were using, which is why it needs to be so big. So it's clearly visible from from there. So guys, we're coming to the end of our two days here, and all the time I've been wanting to pick up on things, you know, because it'd be great for all of mm. us if I felt something. And this overall thing, I feel the most is energized. Mm. Have you experienced what you expected, Hamish? It's been an amazing uh, two days for me. And, you know, finding this this, uh, this landscape at yes. the end just Speaking intrigues me so much. I think the interesting thing for me is that when I'm linking in with the energy, I've been very aware that the ancients' mind, the way they think, is not the same way that we think. Yeah. That they're Say they have such an innate sense of unity with the cosmos, and I don't think I expected that yeah, at all. Yes. And I think it was you, Bar, that was saying that it's been great, though, just the number of people that oh, have visited I've been amazed. the site while we've been here. It's been heartening to see families come and walk around and touch the stones mm -hmm. um, and stay. And I know it's a lovely day, but it's been a constant stream. Yeah, so even have. to this day, people are intrigued. <laughs> what about science? Has it learnt something uh, here? The more and more I do in this sort of area, the more and more I'm convinced that this has got very strong links to mainstream science via the aspects of consciousness. Yeah, because one of the remarkable things is actually the, the extent of the whole site. It spreads out in, in all directions and we could be exploring yeah. over you know, a broad Big circumference area. from here. Anything else to show us? What I want to do is, is uh, you know, this, this little energy centre here has been pulsing away and I want to put a, uh, an amethyst crystal in the centre and ask if there is any reaction to the energy from the earth to the energy of the amethyst crystal. Rupert's research and Julie's findings both indicate that at some point this site would have been used by the ancients to watch and maybe chart the skies. What is clear from the work Hamish has done is that there is a powerful, subtle energy here even today. This earth energy appears to be magnified by the stones and reacts to other energies within the circle. If the ancients also knew this, then this marked out land would have been very sacred. It would have been a place where they could communicate directly with nature. Perhaps it was a place to ask questions and even to receive answers. Could this pattern simply be the result of a reaction from two subtle energy fields? Or is there more to it than that? Our exploration will continue at other sites. explorations into earth energies at sacred sites will continue. We may not come up with answers that suit the established view, but we are sure that there's something very fundamental to be learnt from these places. We're also sure that the ancients acknowledged these energies even if they didn't understand them, and we're all just embarking on a path of rediscovery. Well, I'm pretty happy about the, the, the earth being uh being a sentient being, I mean, there are, I, I, 
there are tens of millions of sentient beings and there are trillions of sentient beings in the in the universe and and you know from our position of, of five senses we're not capable of even understanding that they're there so the whole concept of the earth being living I'm, I'm very happy with is the earth a living being I've never had any doubt about that as soon as one learns to douse and deal with earth energies you suddenly realize that we are on a living being I think it's a very strong and powerful living being I think it's far more powerful than we are um, when I was linking into the earth on one occasion I got the message that if it tired of us or wanted rid of us it could just sneeze and get rid of us which I rather like that that analogy and I'm sure it's right I think the more we realize that it is a living being and we respect it and honor it I think the earth is um, only going to benefit I don't have a problem with the concept of the earth as as a living organism the combined consciousness of every living thing on the planet is all part of the whole planet so the whole earth is it, it's a progressive extension of that I think the ancients had um, a wonderful uh, rapport with the natural energies of the cosmos and they guided their lives and they respected these laws and, and they guided their lives around them and they were influenced by the, the subtle energy changes of the moon and their, their whole being was wrapped around the, the moon cycle. Well the ancients had a truly intuitive understanding of the world. We tend to think because they designed things like stone circles and built them with lots of very complex numbers associated with them that they understood the mathematics but research has shown that it really is intuition that gave them this perspective and I still feel that we need to go back to the ancients to understand lots of things that today we are struggling with. I think we've lost our innate ability to communicate to the planet, to respect the planet, to know the planet and to feel the whole cosmic dance if you like um, I think that if we can get it back, if we can work with it, I think it will help us as human beings. I think it will certainly help the Earth. And I think it will help our, our evolution if we can bring it back in. They were well aware that without the rain, without the sun, um, and without the air and without water, they just wouldn't be. And so they were gods almost, it was a small g for them. And so they very much followed the seasons we've got so out of tune with the natural cycle for instance living in cities people are not aware of almost the seasons where i think the ancients had a knowledge that would benefit us predominantly is going to be in that relationship with the earth one of the things that that we have become so bad at is actually understanding how important the planet and the environment actually is to us. I feel a great joy to start with. I feel a great fulfillment and above all I feel a, a, a tremendous excitement about the potential of what happens when within the circle, within the energy of the circle. When one enters a stone circle, you can treat it on two levels, purely a mechanical one to try to understand its geometry, its design. But then beneath that, you always feel that there's something associated with it that's to do with intellectual creation. And it's that that really gives you the feeling that the whole thing is linked to this living earth. Each sacred space is different. So I can only talk about specifics. If I talk about this one, for instance, there's tremendous power. There's a tremendous sense of connectedness between the Earth, of what we've just been talking about, in fact, connectedness between the Earth and the planets and the whole world. Before you enter, you always acknowledge the Guardian and ask whether you can come in. That's terribly important. Um, and then it opens up to you. If you don't do that, um, 10 to 1, you will only get a very superficial knowledge of what's going on. Um, it 
also depends on how you feel. If you're, if, uh, if you're tired, you don't get a lot. But um, usually when, you go to a, when I go to a sacred circle, I, I'm invigorated tremendously. I do get the impression that there is an energy there that, um, that you are then interacting with. Uh, again, whether you regard it as sentient or not is, is not really the issue. It's actually about having a respect and an openness in, in how you actually make that connection. It knocks all the arrogance out of you and, and it makes you realise that, that this particular life cycle, as far as I'm concerned, is, is one tiny part of our whole existence. It's an important part, but it's a very tiny part. Two words. Life and consciousness. Power. Empowerment, really. Acceptance. I think the ancients had, they had the incredible humility, actually, to, to uh, understand that they were a very, very minor part of this whole great complex. And we've lost that humility. We've, we've decided that we can control it and we can control everything. And, and we've lost the ability to relate to our ultimate creator. The joy comes from realizing that you can actually tune in to the colossal whispering energies of the universe. And suddenly you, you, you realize that we do have a rightful place in the universe.